Well, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's good to see you all here today. Some of you know this is week two in our, in our series called What Would Jesus Undo? What Would Jesus... We thought about getting bracelets, right, you know? I mean, that'd, that'd be a conversation getter, wouldn't it? That would beg the question. I thought he was WWJD. No, it's what would he undo? Now, last week, we talked about cheap grace. I was a little surprised. It seemed like a lot of people were like, I'm, I'm not quite sure what that means. So I just want to redefine it. it. Cheap grace is when we don't hold ourselves accountable for our sin and others to be accountable for their sin. That just cheapens what Jesus did on that cross. It's when we take what is clearly a sin in the Bible and say, oh, it's no longer a sin. That's when we cheapen why he died on the cross for us. And it's when we take what Jesus did on that cross for granted and live however we want. That just cheapens his grace. Well, today, part two, this one might surprise some of you. What would Jesus undo? Self-esteem. Now, some of you are probably thinking right now, well, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. We need self-esteem. Why would Jesus undo self-esteem? I mean, when someone doesn't have a good self-esteem, I mean, they get depressed, they get discouraged, they feel defeated, you know, they want to give up, they make poor choices about taking care of themselves, they get into destructive relationships, and they don't live up to their potential. Yeah, I know that. But then again, what about having too much self-esteem? You think too much of yourself, you can become delusional about yourself and be really annoying. How many of you know somebody with too little self-esteem? How many of you know somebody with too little self-esteem? All right. How many of you know too much self-esteem? And they're really annoying. And they're right next to you. No, don't raise your hand. All right. A, a realistic view of ourselves is, is really what's best. And that's what I want to give all of us today. Um, I got it for myself in preparing this message, and so hear what God has to say. Let's start by talking about what self-esteem really is. Self-esteem is used to describe a, a person's overall perspective of themselves, right? Their self-worth, their value uh, in this world. How many of you remember hearing about Maslow's hierarchy of needs? You remember that? Oh, yeah, good old Maslow. Um, says we need uh, self-esteem, a respect, and positive things coming from others outside of us, but we also need to give it to ourselves. We need both of those to achieve what he calls self-actualization. That means reaching your full potential of all that you can be. Now, while genetics can influence this more often, it has to do with our life experiences. And um, in our lives, if we, if we grow up receiving too much criticism, unwarranted criticism, negativity in our lives from our families, our friends, and so forth, you'll likely have low self-esteem. On the other hand, if you're overly praised and lifted up all the time, given too much credit and too much positive feedback, you'll likely have high self-esteem and be very annoying. That's just what happens. Now, Jesus tackled both of these extremes in this issue of self-esteem. First of all, to the arrogant Pharisee, right? The Pharisees he spoke to all the time in the New Testament. The, 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 those who were saying, I have self-righteousness. I can earn my way to salvation. I don't need anybody else. And Jesus said to them, it's not about you. And then to the most humblest person you can think of. And the woman I think of is, is, is the woman who is begging for scraps of food from the table, so to speak. As a little pet dog, she's looking for grace. She's a Gentile woman and has that kind of conversation with Jesus. Such a humble woman. And Jesus said to her, it's not about you either. One of the most arrogant characters in the Bible, a man loaded with self-esteem, was Saul before he became the apostle Paul. I want to read to you out of Philippians 3 these words where he described his former identity, all right? He says, if anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day 
of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church. As for legalistic righteousness, faultless. Now, is that annoying or what? I just like to hang out with him the way he was. So how do we find that, that, that balance here in self-esteem not being so much about self? Well, Saul, Saul's words beg that question, but Paul gives us the answer. Now, before I go on, I need to warn you, though. You may not like it. You may not like the answer that we're given. In fact, some of you may hate it. I know I did when I first learned it, which wasn't seminary to be a pastor. Crazy time in my life. I'm like, me, a pastor? You've got to be kidding. I, I was afraid to tell people who knew me. That's why when you, when you graduate as a pastor, they don't ever send you back to the community in which you grew up in because they all know you. <laughs> um, well, so here, here's the answer, though, to finding that balance, all right, between having too much and too little self-esteem. In Romans 7, the Apostle Paul is struggling with himself, struggling with the sin. That's, that's where he, he says those words. He says, why do I do the sin I do not want to do? Why don't I do what I should be doing? He goes on and on. He's so struggling. At the end of that chapter, he cries out, O oh, wretched man that I am. The author of a book I'm going to talk about, Don Matson, he says this about that. He says, I remember when I first read that verse reading it over and over again. A wretched man that I am, wretched man that I am, wretched man that I am. And then this hit me. The Apostle Paul didn't have a problem. The Apostle Paul was the problem. That was the issue. The Apostle Paul evaluated his entire life, his former identity, by saying not only, O wretched man that I am, but also saying at the close of his braggadocious statement, you know, if anyone else thinks he has reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. He says this. He says, but whatever was to my profit, whatever I used to think was a real blessing to me. All right? That's what he's saying here. I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. I got rid of that, but look what I have in return. That's the tame translation. Here's a more literal translation from the King James Version. But what things were gained to me I do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Dung. That's manure. All right? Can you imagine a person coming to, to some point in his life when he assesses his entire former identity and regards himself as being scheiss? That's German. <laughs> But this, this, this was the experience of, of the Apostle Paul. Now, as Matzit puts it, he says this. He says this. Paul wasn't shifting from liberal Judaism to conservative Christianity. He wasn't seeking a greater personal holiness from that which he had as a Pharisee. He didn't discard his past to gain a deeper spirituality or a higher position in the church. He wasn't passing through a midlife identity crisis in which he rejected his former identity in order to discover a new self. You know, start jogging, buy a Mercedes, get a new wife. No, he rejected and rebuked his former identity, evaluating it as manure in order to win Christ. Now, I'm sure I don't have to tell you that considering yourself to be a wretch and evaluating your identity and the content of your life as manure does not sit well with a lot of people today. It's why even in our church body, when we use our liturgical written confession out of our hymnal, we've changed it from I, a poor, miserable sinner, to something a lot less shaming because we didn't want to make people feel too bad. When you go to a therapist today, the last thing they want is you walking out of there thinking you're worthless. They want you to see yourself as valuable, a worthwhile human being. I get that. But if that were true, why would you need Jesus? You see, too much self, it lessens my need for Jesus and what he did on that cross. Too much of me, I want less of him. 
You know, when, when people come to me as a pastor for help in dealing with some aspect of their lives, I, I don't always relish, you know, sharing with them an assessment of their life and worth according to the Bible because it sometimes can come across as being insensitive. I don't like being seen as insensitive. But when you think about it, I mean, I mean, how many psychologists would actually have the nerve to say to someone who's spilling their guts to them, my dear, you don't have a problem. You are the problem. That wouldn't help out his business too much, would it? You know, it's probably the last thing anybody wants to hear. But here's the reality. Let's thank you, God. Thank you, God, for loving us enough to tell us the truth. We need you. All of you. Our human condition is based upon cold, hard, historical, biblical, and spiritual facts that we can't avoid. The question is, what are you going to do about it? In fact, a better question, though, is what has God already done about it? And that's when we go to the cross. And we say, that is who did it for me. You see, my imperfection, your imperfection, required his perfection. That's what this is all about. It required that. And then giving us that, imputing that to us through our faith in him so that we can one day stand in the presence of a holy God. Praise God for that. What a gift that is. Now, in the book that I've been referencing by Don Matzot, he titles this book not self-esteem. Any guesses? Christ esteem. And his point is find your identity in Jesus not yourself find it in christ because it's not about how we feel it's about what jesus did you know the call of the gospel that jesus gives us in his word is a call to turn away from ourself and to turn to jesus because self is the problem and jesus is the solution that's why Paul writes those words I read a moment ago. Jesus died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Live for him. Mere Christianity, classic of C.S. Lewis. He writes this. If you are one of these hurting people, he was describing, the question is, are you hurting enough to give up on yourself? Are you unhappy enough and miserable enough to turn away from yourself with all your problems and failures and seek relief in a relationship with the person of Jesus Christ. Many claim to be hurting, but are really not hurting enough. Not hurting enough to finally say, God help me, because I can't do it. That's what Jesus meant when he said to the Pharisees, it's not about you. That's what he meant when he said to the humble woman, it's not about you, it's about me. It's about him. Some of you have probably heard this illustration. I, I think it, it fits in well to drive home this truth. There's a story about, about two men standing on the ocean shore. One of them is an excellent But they're just standing there and they're looking out and they see a man who's swimming quite a distance from shore. And suddenly something goes terribly wrong, and the man starts to scream for help. Well, the non-swimmer friend turns to his friend, the excellent swimmer, and says, Aren't you going to help him? You're a great swimmer. That man's in trouble. And his friend calmly responds, Not yet. Well, after just a few more moments, it, it got worse. The, the, the man is, is just freaking out. His head is going under again and again and again. He's fighting for his life. And the one friend turns to the other friend and says, Save him! Save him. He's going to die. He begs his friend. And his friend calmly responds, not yet. And finally the man stops thrashing the water and starts to sink. The swimmer then jumps into the water, out to the man, brings him to shore, and the drowning man lives. 
but his friend was still confused and pretty ticked. <laughs> and so he said, I, I don't get it. Why did you wait so long to save the man he could have died? And his friend responds, I had no choice. If I would have gone to him immediately, he would have panicked and pulled me down with him. I had to wait until he stopped kicking. Then I could save him. I had that happen to me once. Out in the cold lakes of Minnesota, <laughs> swimming, there's almost always a dock out from shore. You've got to be a fairly good swimmer to get out to the dock, and I finally got to the age and strength where I could get out there. My younger sister wanted to go out to the dock too because that's where you dove and have fun. Well, I, I told my sister I'd, I'd go with her. I'd, I'd go right next to her, and we'd swim out there. Halfway there, she couldn't, she couldn't continue. She panicked. And she jumped on my neck and I almost drowned. She just was fighting. And I finally had to push her underwater. Just push her there. Get her to stop so I could then push her to shore. Though I knew preaching on this topic of self-esteem would raise some questions today, like why would Jesus undo self-esteem? I wanted to raise this question. Are you willing to stop kicking and let Jesus save you. Are you willing? Are you willing to take all the problems that you have in your life, all the challenges, all your faults, and all your failures and see them as being what God wants to use to refine you? to make you stronger, to trust in him more, to bring you an end to yourself, to rely on yourself, and rather rely on him. He is the one who died and rose so you could too. Are you willing to let Jesus do what he does best? You know, God makes it clear in his word that he made every single one of us for a purpose. He made you who you are. He gave you and me the gifts that we have. And he wants us to live our lives for him. He wants to use you. Just like that song is saying, it's, sometimes it's hard. But it's all about, you know, when the pressure's on, well, how are diamonds formed? Pressure. He wants to make diamonds out of dust, diamonds out of us. And he can only do so when we stop kicking, when we just rely on him. Whoever wants to be my disciple, Jesus said, must deny himself and take up the cross daily and follow me. In Philippians chapter 2, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Think of others as being better than you. That's a challenge. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. He goes on to say, in your relationships with one another, have the same mind as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, something to, to, to use to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. And therefore God exalted him to the highest place, and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Beautiful words of promise. This is a, was a personal message. <laughs> To me, it's, it, it hit me home because, as many of you know, I didn't want to be a pastor. I, I fought it, ran for it, from it for a long time because I knew I wasn't worthy. I knew that. There's no way I could be a pastor. 
Ask anybody who knew me. What did I think I was going to do? Stand up on some fictitious pedestal and tell you how to live your lives? And then God used his hammer to knock some sense into me and, and taught me that it's not about me. It's about me trusting him. It's about finding my identity in him. Not in me and not who I was. I was just a vessel. So are you. He wants to use you. All of us. But you know what? It still took seven years as a pastor before I finally came to grips with this truth. In spite of me, God loves me. Seven years before I finally got it. I mean, really got it. I knew it up here. I didn't know it here. And I remember the very moment when it happened because it, God had broken me. And I, and I went to my associate pastor, Pastor Mac, I just a great guy. I said, I need you to pray for me. I need to know God's love. And it changed my life in that prayer is where God broke through. And what, what I learned was how deceptive our feelings can be the way we feel about things, what we sometimes call self-esteem. We get down on our appearance. We, 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 we get down on ourselves too hard on how smart we are or whatever. We're hard on ourselves. And I learned it's not about me. And it's not about my feelings about me either. It's about needing something outside of us to hold on to, something that is not us. So that no matter how we feel, we know we're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Because he Otherwise, you're on an emotional roller coaster. You feel good, you're saved. You feel bad, you're damned. And it just goes up and down like it had been for me for many years. Outside of us is our Savior. And there's nothing you can do. Nothing you can do. To make God love you more or less. He just does. I don't know when the last time any of you picked up the Luther Small Catechism and read the first article and its explanation, but I love all three explanations, but I'm just going to read the first one here. The first article is, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. What does this mean? Do you remember that? The big question, what does this mean? I believe that God has made me and all creatures, that he has given me my body and soul, eyes, ears, and all my members and still preserves them. My reason and all my senses, he also gives me clothing and shoes, food and drink, house, home, wife and children, land, animals, and all that I have. He richly and daily provides me with all that I need to support this body and life, all that I need. He defends me against all danger, and guards and protects me from all evil. And all this he does only out of fatherly, divine goodness and mercy. Say this next part. Without any merit or worthiness in me. One more time. Without any merit or worthiness in me. For all this it is my duty to thank and praise, serve and obey him. Why? Because this is most certainly true, and it is. Trust it. In Jesus' name, amen.